text because this isn't the message. This is this is something that Lord laid on my heart this morning at your worship. And this goes for this goes for all of us. Amen. You know, someone told me one time, kind of dumb for them to say this, but they did. They come up and they say, you know, Pastor, you need to be in the back. So people can have the freedom to worship. I looked at them and I said, you know what? Show me one shepherd that's always good in the back. The sheep need to see the shepherd. Is that true? Yes. So for what do you feel free if you were in the back? It looks like then you'd be watching. He's watching us, yeah. right? Yeah. So remember, I don't know if any of you are, you are aware with sheep herders or not, or shepherds, but a shepherd will always try to find a safe place for his sheep. Right? And when the shepherd finds a safe place for his sheep, he doesn't go to the back of the of the group and lay down and go to sleep. No, what he does, if he has to construct a little wall, he'll construct a little wall and go lay across the opening. You know why it lays across the opening? So nothing comes in and no one goes out. That's simply to say that I'm not, I'm not, he's not, he's not keeping you from doing what, what you want to do, but he's keeping you safe by making sure that nothing detrimental to your health comes in and you don't go out and find yourself in trouble. Amen. So, I disagree with the fact that you need to be in the back so people can be free in worship. I, I don't go that way. Um, so, you know, when someone says you need to be, when you need to be not seen, you can be heard, but you can't be seen, we don't work that way, do we? Amen. Exodus chapter 17. And I'm not going to pronounce the word, but I know it, so don't. Uh, hold that against me, man. I have a hard enough time to pronounce an English word, right? <clears throat> you all there? Say amen. 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 Verse 8. Then Amalek came and fought against Israel that repped him. So Moses said to Joshua, Choose men for us and go out and fight against Amalek tomorrow, and I will station myself on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Does that sound like the shepherd went behind the crowd? He went in front of the crowd, didn't he? He stood on top of the hill. So it came about when Moses held his hands up, the Israelites prevailed. And when he let his hands down, Amalek prevailed. But what does that say to your hearts? When the shepherd, or in this case Moses, which was the shepherd of Israel, right? Whenever he would would allow the, the sheep, if you will, the fighters to see him holding his hands up, they were, man, we're gonna we're gonna do this. We're gonna get this done. But whenever he got tired and put his hands down, the enemy began to win. Amen. It's right here in scripture. But Moses' hands were heavy. Then they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands on one side and one on the other. Thus his hands were steady until the sunset. So Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the members of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar. But the point I'm trying to get across here is your shepherd needs support. Amen? Your shepherd needs support. We've seen that the Israelites supported him, Moses, physically. Right? I'm here to tell you, this shepherd needs your support spiritually. I beg you to pray for me and my wife. I pray for you to lift us up. Because without that strength, without God's people holding us up in prayer, the devil is seeking to devour and destroy. Amen? So don't stop praying for us. Keep us in prayer and know this. I don't say this selfishly. I don't say I want, I had a voice, but we cannot do this alone. Amen? Someone came up to me a few weeks, well, it's been a few months ago. You know, you need to, you need to go out to and meet the people. No, I don't. You need to go out and evangelize the people. As a pastor, I'm called to evangelize the people that he brings in. Is that true? Yes. And 
to strengthen them, to feed them, and to care for them. But a pastor can't go knock on every door in the neighborhood. It's up to God's chosen people to evangelize. Aren't they called evangelists? Go into all the world. Some things can wear heavy on an individual. Amen? So as Moses' arms were lifted up, I pray that you lift us up. Amen? Keep us, keep us lifted up and keep us in a place of uh, strength. Amen? I got something I'd like to read that I read in here. It's about honoring your leaders in the Lord's work. Go ahead, brother. It's about encouraging your pastor. And it's funny because I just like Chris read, it, read this on Wednesday night. And I don't want to read it here for a while. He said, if you want to encourage your pastor, there's seven things in here. This is the first one. Cut the criticism. Most workers are evaluated each year based on their job performance. Pastors are evaluated every week. Remember, if a particular sermon doesn't scratch you where you itch, chances are somebody else needs to hear it. Amen. Number two, remember your leaders who taught you the word. That's Hebrews 13, 7 in the NLT. And pray for their spiritual growth. Though it said, if you treat a person as he is, he'll stay that way. But if you treat him as he ought to be, he'll become what he ought to be and could be. And number three, write a note, especially when something your leader says or does, ministers to you. Verbal encouragement is good, but a note can be read many times over. Number four, put your talents to work. For example, if you're mecha me mechanically inclined, uh, service the pastor's car. If you're techno uh, technologically uh, savvy, help improve their computer skills. Instead of saying you're, you're need, uh, to do the, you need to do this, say I'd like to help by doing. Ask where your skills are most needed and become an active participant. Okay, number five, squash gossip. James said, if you don't control your tongue, your religion is worthless. Okay, counter negative talk with positive comments and correct misinformation with truth. If all else fails, walk away. Number six, uh, be openly responsive. Nothing encourages leaders like seeing people respond to their preaching and teaching. Number seven, lose the measuring stick. Instead of expecting them to mirror, be the mirror image of their predecessor, Thank God for your pastor's individual style and minister to those in need. Praise God. Thank you, Herschel. Good word. Okay. Um, we're going to be in Job. Might as well get there, Job chapter 2. Um, I've been studying Job quite intensely lately, and I used to think one thing about Job, and I came to think of another thing about Job. But in my study of Job, with a companion that I'm using, I found out a total different aspect of Job that most of us probably don't even read. So this morning I'm going to share a little bit with you what God has showed me in just a few scriptures about Job. And I'm so thankful that um, men in olden days and men in modern days, the Spirit has revealed mysteries to them. Because as the Spirit reveals mysteries to them, the mysteries are revealed to us. Amen? The Holy Spirit has promised through the, the words of Jesus that He will reveal mysteries, the deep mysteries of the Word, to each and every one of us. Amen? Amen. So when He reveals a mystery to you that's directly from Him, that's a shout. Amen? Amen? When He reveals a mystery to you through another one that He's already revealed the mystery to, and it lines up with the word, it lines up with what you believe, that's even a bigger shout. God has used people since the beginning of time to share and show people the way. Amen? We can't all believe we have it all. As soon as you start believing that we have it all, you are in trouble. The devil shows up and says, you know what, you're not all that in a bag of chips anyway, are you? And you're not eating fruity cheese, you're eating that stinky old whatever that cheese is that stinks, right? Isn't that what he does? But greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come with me to Job chapter 2. If you're there, say amen. amen. And I'm going to start now. The first chapter was all about the, uh, Satan showing up to the throne room and, and, and asking God, asking where you've been and this and that. Um, you can read the first chapter. Job lost his family, lost his livestock, lost everything. 
because of the uh, because of Satan wanting to 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 uh, uh, bring questions and stuff on him. But look at here. It says chapter two says this. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Isn't that amazing? I think I might have referenced this before. Isn't that amazing that Satan still has to ask God for permission to send you? What does that tell you about God and His power and His control? He hasn't relinquished nothing. Everything is still in God's hands. When the enemy of the world has to ask God permission to do something, we are in pretty good hands, aren't we? what he says here. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, I'm from roaming about in the earth and walking around in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered, and that word considered for a minute there, have you taken notice of? Have you Inspected? Have you looked at my servant Job? Have you noticed Job? Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth. I pray that God will look at us one day and say, There's no one like him on earth. Isn't that amazing? What would that do for your... I'm not talking about false pride. What would that do for your righteous pride? You know what? I am awesome in God's eyes. You are awesome in God's eyes. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you're going to go through, you are awesome in God's eyes. Amen? A blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil, he still holds fast his integrity, although you have incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Now God said, you know what? Devil, Lucifer, whatever God called him, Satan, Look at all that you've done to him. And he's still holding true to his confession. You, you, you've incited me against him and he's still standing up for righteousness. Now granted, as we go on to the book of Job, as you read the book of Job, you realize that Job walked in his own righteousness. Amen? He didn't, he didn't, he, well, we're not going to go there. Okay, we'll go, we'll go there later. And the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. And he still holds fast his integrity. Although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give you his life. In other words, everything that a man has, everything that you allow him to have, surely he's going to worship you. Surely he's going to, he's going to give you everything that he has, all of his worship and all of his praise. Sure, because you've given it, you haven't taken anything away. First of all, folks, God doesn't take away. God only adds. The enemy takes away. Sometimes what the enemy is allowed to take away, he's asked permission to sift. He's asked for permission to incite. He's asked for permission to bring stuff upon you. Otherwise, it can't happen. And God allows it for one purpose and one purpose only, so that your righteousness will not be in you, but will be in Him. And your strength will prove strength in Him and not in you. i got to tell you something, folks. I was sharing with Tim this morning. I've been through a battle. I've been through a battle. My wife and I are in a battle. Sometimes you ask God, God, why are we going through this? Why are we going through this? Why? Are we, what's going on? And the simple answer to me is this, because you're going to need to fight this fight to fight what's coming next. You ever ask yourself why an alcoholic, a full-blown alcoholic, changes the earth's his or her life and accepts Jesus and walks in that freedom from alcohol? You ever ask yourself why? So they can minister to those who are still stuck in it. Have you ever asked yourself why God has dropped the, 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 the pride from you and gave you a, a genuine humility so you can help those who walk in it still? Amen. Have you ever asked God, God take this anger away from me and he takes it away from you so you can help those in anger? Have you ever noticed yourself getting angry over something stupid? Right? Why am I so mad? Because I was put out. I was put out. This person said, did whatever. I was put out. So I'm mad. Okay. What happens when, let me ask you a question and then we'll continue. What happens if you 
have a temper tantrum. We all have temper tantrums, right? None of us are perfect. Some of us worse than others. Some of us over different things than others. But what happens if you have a temper tantrum? The guy you're having a temper tantrum with walks up and says, you know, it's okay. It's all right. I'll help you with this. You don't, you don't have to... You don't have to. You don't have to be so overwrought. Oh no, it's okay. You made it all, man. Why feel stupid? Yeah, I, mean, I just feel stupid. I just got all mad and burned out of shape for no reason. And this guy, who's who, I don't really even know. It's gonna be okay. Your first thought is, man, that when you go home, you man. <laughs> right? Turn with me to First Corinthians or Second Corinthians, chapter four. Keep your finger on the first Corinthians chapter four. Now remember, Job just went to Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Corinthians chapter four. Remember, Job just went through a horrific deal. Ordeal. And I was sharing with the folks on Wednesday night, if you ever ask yourself when you meet Job, there's a part in there where Job's wife says, Curse God and die. What we don't realize is what she watched her family and her husband go through. So for her to say, curse God and die, it wasn't an anger. It wasn't a, you know what, you, you fool? No, it's like, I, my heart's breaking for you, Joe. I can't see you going through this no more. We've lost our family. We've lost our livelihood. Our house got blown away in, her, in whatever that breeze was. Our children are gone. And now you're sitting here in this, in this, in this, sawdust pit in this in this ash pit you got boils and you're scraping yourself can you imagine a wife's heart Joe don't I can't see it going through this no more curse God and die get it over with it wasn't for you know what Joe you're messing up buddy curse God and die you don't know it was her compassion her compassion for Joe for her husband second Corinthians chapter four verse uh, six for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that surpass greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. Verse 8. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. Perplexed but not despairing. Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we live, for we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. We go through things to prove Jesus is righteous. We go through the attacks of the enemy to prove that Jesus is righteous. To prove that His death and resurrection gives us the power and the ability to walk in the freedom even in times of distress. The things that the enemy throws at us cannot destroy us. Cannot destroy us. We might scratch our head, what's going on, but it cannot destroy us. It cannot bring us to a place of fall. Well, you know, sometimes you feel like it. I felt like it. I feel like just saying, you know what? I've had it. I can't do this no more. I just, I, I, I just had it. I, I can't, I can't walk another step. And the Lord says something, or I read something, or I go, I go through Job. And what a time for, and I'm, I'm not going to go into detail, but what a time for me to go through the book of Job. For me to go through the book of Job at this time in my ministry, in my life, is absolutely a shining pearl. Okay? And I think one reason why we go through what we go through, we should never keep it bottled up. Would you agree? We should never keep it inside because there's brothers and sisters out there who want to know that you're not perfect, man. The devil's also attacking you. Well, this is what happens when I get attacked. Let me share with you. Let me share with you. Let me pray with you. Let me hold you up. Because the enemy will not stop attacking you until you are home to be with Jesus. First Peter chapter 1. Hallelujah. 
First Peter chapter one, where you go to verse uh, whatever. I'm going to start with verse four. To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Verse 7, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. The enemy wants you to take your eyes off of what Jesus has done for you so you can walk around in a waller. Amen? I've been in that wall. Amen? So I'm not saying you're immune to it. But what I am saying is Jesus has the power to bring you out of it. The problem is, I think, is we have to make a choice to let him bring us out of it instead of wallowing it. Amen? I've had individuals tell me before about the book of Job. You know, uh, I think my life's the book of Job. I said, really? What makes you think your life's the book of Job? Well, because I've lost everything, haven't you? Did your house blow away? No. Did your kids die? No. Did your cars break down? Drop foot? No. Did you lose your property? No. Can you eat? Yeah. Then how can you count? How can you say you're like Joe? Well, Pastor, I'm tired of being in debt. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of that. Well, you know what? Take control of that debt. Take control of what the enemy has taken from you simply because you made a choice. You made a choice to live like Job. And I asked him, I said, did you read the end of Job? No, I'm afraid to read the end. I said, you need to read the end of Read all the Don't start something in the middle and give up. Because I got news for you. The end of Job was like, whoa, hallelujah. Amen. But when someone wants to come up to you and convince you they have a life of Job, tell them, you know what? You don't have the first clue of what Job went through. So quit using Job as your excuse to walk in self-pity. Is that, is that cruel? It's the truth, isn't it? We have to make a choice to come above, to come above what the enemy throws at us. And I believe when God brings us through things, we need to share them. I had a pastor tell me last week, I, he called me on the phone and I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm not really sure I can help you. This is a couple of days ago. And he says, why? I said, because I'm going through my own thing. He said, what are you going through? And I began to share with him what I'm going through and this and that. And uh, he said, man, you know, that's pretty tough. I said, yeah, but greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. He said, I think I just gave up. I said, well, I'm not a giver up right he said, I, I, I can't. I said, what are you going through? Well, um, not what you're going through. I said, everybody goes through different stuff. That's what you do with the stuff that makes you a, an overcomer. Amen? And without someone that you can confide in, without, without someone you can talk to, thank you very much, Tim, you're a blessing to me. Without someone you can talk to and confide in, you hold it in. But when we understand what we're to go through to be a better believer and walk in righteousness, then we have, we, we're going to go through stuff, folks. Amen? Yes. You know, when... How many of you heard me say this before? You have a knower and you have a brain. Right? When God gives you revelation, where does the revelation begin? In your brain or your knower? Your knower is your spirit. Your knower is where the Holy Spirit resides. You will understand something, get revelation first in your spirit before you ever figure it out in your brain. 
But most people want to walk around by what they figure out, what they can understand, what they can, what they can visualize with their head. And it's all about the knower in your spirit. The spirit always reveals before your head everything's wrapped around that. Amen. Here with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. But let him who is the greatest among you become as the youngest and a leader as the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines the table or the one who serves? It is not the one who reclines the table, but I'm among you as the one who serves. And you are those who have stood by me in my trials. Wait a minute. You have stood by me in my trials. <clears throat> Two words. My trials. Jesus had trials, folks. If Jesus, the Son of God, God incarnate, went through trials and tribulations, so will you. But like he said here, you stood by me in my trials. Don't abandon someone that's going through something because you don't get it. Amen? My wife is going through stuff right now where I can easily say, I don't get it. But I understand it. And I know what you're going through. And I have to keep reminding her over and over, this is what you have. This is why you're going through this. This is why, you know, you probably all of you probably have been there. But the enemy always seems to say, yeah, right. How? Yeah. Folks, we serve a God who knows every fiber of your being. And the devil knows where he can get you by what you speak out this thing. The first time you confess fear, he jumps all over that. The first time you confess anxiety, the first time you confess anger, the first time you confess doubt, the first time you confess shame, the first time you confess I cannot do this, he jumps on Yeah, you're right. Why are you even trying? Amen? I think of people who are called away from their families. And the enemy, the whole time they're gone, is eating at them. I wonder what he or I wonder what she is doing. And there doesn't have to be any, anything ever happen. That's the way the enemy works. If the enemy can get your mind off of what you're doing, what God has called you to, then he puts you in a perplexed mode where, man, I can't fulfill what God's called me to because I'm too, wor too worried about this. We have to make a choice to either follow or not to follow. Amen. And let me tell you something, folks. Jesus is pressuring you to do anything. All he says is only believe. You come follow me. Amen? So with all the things that Job went to, losing everything, he still maintained a presence with God. Verse uh, 27. For who is greater the one who reclined the table? I'll read it again. For who is greater the one who reclined the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclined the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. And you are those who have stood by me in my trials. And just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I grant you. That you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And then he turns to Simon Peter. And he says these words, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like Remember in Job when the sons of God showed up at the throne room and Satan says, you know what, what I am? You keep 
protect him like that, and sure he'll serve you. Sounds to me like the devil has never stopped getting permission to sift you like wheat. Look at what else he says here. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. Let's, let's, let's look at that revelation for a minute. Jesus just told Simon Peter that you're going to be sifted by the enemy. The devil has asked permission to sift you. Why do you think the enemy asked Peter asked for permission to sift Peter? Because the enemy knew that if he could defeat Peter, he could defeat God's plan through Peter, which was the beginning of the church. Amen? Satan knew that if I can convince Peter that he's not going to make it, then he can't go forward what God has called him to do. Satan says the same thing about you. If I can defeat you, if I can defeat what God has called you to do in your life, if I can wreak havoc in your life and cause you to not be a believer, then you will not fulfill the destiny that God has for you. And he's won. But then he says this. Then Jesus says, but Peter, I prayed for you. Who other... What other better prayer partner can you have than God Himself? Amen? Peter, I have prayed for you. Jesus prays for you before you even realize you're going to go through something. Amen? But what we do sometimes is we wear it ourselves and think we're in this battle alone and we're not. I can just imagine in Job's story, I can just imagine angels standing around the throne room and saying, you know what, Father, if you just release us, we'll take care of this dude. If you'll just, if you'll just say, if you just give the word and we'll take care of this dude. And I can almost visualize God saying, it's okay, he's got it, it's okay, it's okay, I got him right here, he's all right. The same with you. Father, if you'll dispatch us, we'll take care of these spirits. We'll take care of these demonic forces. We'll take care of these things that surround your people. But you know what the difference is? The difference is this. You walk with the Holy Ghost in you. Amen? The Holy Spirit has taken up residence in you. You have the ability to say, stop, devil, you can't come. Stop, demon, you can't come. Stop, enemy. You can't. You can't do this. You can't do this. And when you recognize he's doing something in your life, you have the ability to say, no, not today. If you begin to have fear, can't do it. If you begin to have anger, can't do it. I remember one time I was going through, working for my pastor at the church as a custodian. And I think I told you I used to pray for the toilets and for the urinals and everything else. When nobody's in there, I practice. I practice. <coughs> Speaking tongues and everything. One day, this, some, some, some joyful little lad went to the bathroom and stuffed a softball down the, the toilet. It wasn't a full size softball because it probably wouldn't fit. But it was a, one of them soft softballs, you know. And I don't think he only stuffed, I think he actually put there and was shoving this thing in there. So I get a call from somebody saying, uh, John, there's some there's an issue with the toilet. I, know. I brought my plunger, you know, because that's usually the problem is with an issue. So I walk over there and here's this ball stuck at the bottom of this toilet. <laughs> so I'm thinking, how am I gonna get this thing out of there? I thought of all kinds of things. I'll stick something, I'll cut it up, nothing was working. You know what happened? I got mad. I got angry. I began to yell at the toilet, like, what was I going to do? <laughs> right? So, then I find myself wanting to go find the kid that stuck the ball down the toilet. Right? I'm going to find this kid and tell him, you know, get your little hands down there and pull this thing out. You see how, you see how fear began, or not fear, but anger began to take over my sanity? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, well, you know what, just back off, take the screws off the floor. Take the toilet out, take it outside, and I'll bet you can get the ball out that way. <laughs> so I took the toilet off the floor, went outside, and got a big metal rod, and poked it from the bottom. You know how they got that little corner thing? Well, I took one of them uh, 
uh, hard, stiff rods that you can form. And I, I got the ball out to make a long story short. So all my ranting and raving and fear and wanting to kick the toilet and drown the kid was for nothing. <laughs> was for nothing. But you know what? That's what the enemy does. Yes. When something begins to go wrong in your life or something begins to, to take your joy, you get angry. Job never got angry. Did he? Job never got angry. Job took everything that God allowed, and I say allowed, allowed to happen in his life to bring him to a better end. He realized who God was. He realized that, you know what, I've been making a mistake. I've been thinking it's all about me. I was telling my wife a story the other day. When I lived in Huntington Beach, we used to have this family down at the end of the block. They had nine or ten kids. They were from Kentucky. So they talked Kentucky, right? Nice family. But you know what I told my wife last night? It just, it, it dawned on me. We could be out until midnight, one, two in the morning, doing what kids do. And that mom or that dad of that family would always come out and make sure everyone was okay. And when they were having food or barbecues or something, every neighbor in the, every kid in the neighborhood was in that house. Which... Later on in life, when I came to the Lord, I thought to myself, you know what? They had to be believers. They had to be Christians because you couldn't wrong them. You couldn't steal from them. We tried. But you couldn't. There's always something. You know what? You ain't getting in. So I was telling my wife about this family that they just seemed to love everybody at any time. It didn't matter. They was always having orphans coming in. They was always having the worst of it. They was all that was. Aren't the family of God supposed to be that way? Yes. Aren't we supposed to be that way? When someone shows up in our midst, it doesn't quite look like he's, you know, doing or she's doing great. Well, what do we do? Well, man, you need to stay open. No. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. It doesn't matter what background you have. It doesn't matter who you were before. It doesn't matter what kind of temperament you had before. Let God take that away from you. Let God take away from you that your people are above these people because you're not. Yeah. Folks, one ethnic group hasn't got nothing on the other. Because in case you don't, in case you don't know this, God doesn't see that. God says he, he sees his creation. So when we make excuses to stay in our life like Job did, and to say, well, that's just my that's just my aunt in life. That's your fault. Make the choice not to stay there. I, I explained this to someone a couple years ago. And have you ever talked to your blue in the face? When are you going to get it? Well, never have gone. And the reason why they never have gone is because they haven't made a choice to stop it. And I've told individuals before, if you get up in the morning, if you have a business, if you have a daycare, whatever it is, get up in the morning before your kids show up, before you have to go to work, before you run your coffee, run out the door and get on with your day without interceding, talking to God first. Take a little bit of time. God, what do you want me to do today? Do you want me to sit right here and do nothing? Yeah, I do. What? How am I going to make any money? If I, if I ask you to stay there and do nothing, I will supply your needs according to my riches in my glory. Amen? But sometimes we have the tendency to think, well, God didn't do it, so I need to do it. Right? The other day I was in the, the bank, and uh, I, I go, I have a, the, the church account on my computer, and I go there every once in a while. I don't know why. God, you know, you, I'm sure you pray over your finances too. Why pray over the church's finances? Well, as I was praying, I remember one particular day I went in there and made the church deposit. Oh, that's cool. By the time I got home, folks, this is how God works. By the time I got home, I opened up the, the account again, because, you know, sometimes it takes overnight to do this and do that. And there was a deposit in there that I didn't make. Whether you realize it or not, that's stinking awesome. 
there was a deposit in there that I didn't make, and the deposit was a significant amount of money. I don't mean millions, I don't mean trillions. Enough money, God put enough money in there, led someone to put enough money in there, not only to meet the church's need, but to also meet Lisa and I's needs. That's how God works. But you have to make a choice. Lord, this is yours. My life belongs to you. My verbal communication belongs to you. And uh, I'm going to use Eva for example. I hope you don't mind Eva. She's working in paradise. And she's working in the kitchen. I can feed all the workers. Is that correct? I'm thinking about what she sees. I'm thinking about what she's observing during this, this horrible, horrible thing that happened. You know what? The Lord, the Lord spoke to this to me the other day as I was contemplating on different things and what Eva does with her work and, and, and how faithful she is to that and some of you other people that, that have those type of jobs. I'm thinking to myself, Lord, would anybody else be able to do what these individuals do? You know the response was to me? No. It's like that, no. I said, why? He said, because they follow me. They follow my direction. They follow my lead. And because of that, they minister to me. Cliff gave me an email the other day. And he was all upset because I guess you had a key or something on one of your jobs. And you know what his first response was? My guy's all right. Oh, my guy's all right. So he sent me an email. Pastor Frank, we just had a cave in. And then immediately following that, thank God all my guys were out. He Cliff began, is that true, Cliff? Cliff began to run around. Man, I hope, you know, can you imagine how frantic it is? But let me ask you a question. Joe Schmo from Kokomo, who didn't have the love of Jesus in his heart, couldn't do that. Wouldn't do that. What do you think of it? Well, I'm glad I'm safe. So God has called us all for a particular reason for a particular thing, for a particular uh, uh, gifting that we have. Amen? We all have a gifting. And Satan tried to remove Job's gifting. If you read the book of Job, Job was always feeding, always giving, always doing this and always doing that in his own righteousness, but he was still doing it. You, mean, you know there's a passage in Job where Job is so concerned about his kids, every, once, every week they go to meet in each other's house and they have dinner and they commune and they have food. You know what Job does after that every time? He has a burnt offering for him just in case they discussed something that was wrong or did something that was wrong in his eyes, fearing that maybe they did something to, to make God mad. So he sacrificed for them. He didn't even have the Holy Spirit. Have we ever sacrificed for somebody and we walk in the Holy Spirit? Oh, should. The book of Job is full of sacrifice. I don't know if you realize that when you read it or not, but it's full of sacrifice. It's full of understanding who God is in an individual. And then the whole rest of the scriptures that I wrote you today are to encourage you, or I gave you today, or encourage you that when you go through stuff, it's going to be okay. Emotion, you might think, you know what, I'm done. And the enemy says, you know what, you need, to, you need to be done. But God would always give you the strength to carry on if, in fact, it's his will to do so. Amen? It, it, you know, it was a very, very important and, and good advice when someone says this to you. Maybe you ought to lay it down before the Lord and hear what he has to say. Amen? I am so thankful for godly men and women. I am so thankful for godly men and women that, that aren't, and I don't want to say afraid, because that's not what I'm saying, but have the, the strength and the love to say, you know, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should do this. So as we read through the scripture, as we read through Job, we see all kinds of situations that he came up with that came against him. So when we read 2 Corinthians about the battles and stuff that we're going to undergo, we're, just because we undergo them don't mean we're doing something wrong. We're doing something pretty stinking right. If you're doing something wrong, Satan won't want anything to do with you. He's got you. And as soon as you veer from that path, Matthew 24, as soon as you veer from that path, but as long as you stay on that path, he'll be, he'll be checking on you. 
Okay? As long as you get out of God's line, as long as you walk away from God, as long as you make every stinking excuse you want to make in the stinking world about not serving God, about not going to church, about not reading your Bible, about not praying, shame on you. And I don't mean that for anybody here. I mean that for people who think they can get over on God by professing but not walking. Amen? I talked to an individual the other day, and uh, I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm this, I'm that. I said, maybe you want to quit doing this, doing that. Well, I can. I got this going. I got this going. I said, do you hear what you're saying? No. I said, you're saying I. You use the I word too much. When you give over to him, it's no longer I, it's we. It's us. It's me and you, Lord. It's me and you, Lord. So, when people continue to walk in the same walk that they're in with no development, with no maturity, with no insight to what God's beginning or has or, or going to do in their life, you have, to, you have to ask them a question. Are you reading? Are you praying? Are you seeking God? Because I'll tell you what, folks, if the enemy can get you straight away from seeking God, Next thing you know, everything you do is more important than God. When you begin to look at your circumstances and begin to look at the things around you, they become more important than serving God. What can I do to make this better? Nothing. What do I have to do to make this better? Nothing. What else? Drop the eye. Lord, what can we do to make this better? Then you might hear something. Well, like first thing you do is quit worrying about it. Quit worrying about it. How many of you know that's hard to do in your flesh? Yes. Amen. But Paul says, I die daily. I die to my flesh every day. And what is your flesh? Flesh isn't your it isn't your touchy feeling. Your flesh is your is, is is what causes you to worry and doubt and fear. You heard the word spirit soul, right? But sometimes we think we know better than God. And what does that tell you about that? Check yourself before you wreck yourself. I like that. Right? But what do we do? We think we've got it all figured out, don't we? We think we have it all under control. We think we know what's best for us. We don't have a clue what's best for us. But God does. And the reason why I think we're, we're going through these messages is because we need to be prepared for what God has for us and what He's doing and what, in the, what He's in the middle of. And the last, I heard a guy last, two weeks ago. I'm not even going to mention you know exactly who it is. But a few weeks ago, this brother came to me and, and uh, right here in this in the sanctuary, he said some different things. I said, I said, sir. He said, yeah. I said, maybe you need to quit looking. Maybe you quit. Maybe you need to quit listening to you and begin to listen to him. Well, I have an issue with this. I have an issue with that. So that's your problem. You know, you don't always have to be heard, buddy. Let God work something out in you. Let God, let God show people who you are, not you try to convince them who you are. The Bible says you know them by their fruits. Not the fruit you're stuffing down their throat, but the fruit, the fruit that they see. Amen? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Whoa! Peter, once you've gotten strength back, once you turn back to me, basically, once you went through what you're going through, take your brothers and take care of them, encourage them, strengthen them. Don't hold it in yourself. And we all know what Peter went through. Right? Oh, Lord, I will never leave you. I'll go anywhere this morning. I'll even die for you. What's Jesus said? Peter said, Lord, with you, I am ready to go both to prison and to death. Remember when you say something, you're going to be challenged on it. 
Job was challenged on it. Everything Job professed he was challenged on, wasn't he? I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the cock will not crow and today until you have denied three times that you even know me. Can you imagine? And he said to them, when I sent you out without purse and bag and sandals, you did not lack anything, did you? And they said, no, nothing. And he said to them, but now let him who has a purse take it along, likewise also a bag, and let him who has no sword sell his robe and buy one. What sword is he talking about? He's talking about the word. He's talking about the power that's in the word. Now they couldn't go to the corner bookstore and buy a Bible, could they? This wasn't available. What Jesus is basically saying here is, is pay attention to what I've taught you. And, and, and give up all your earthly belongings and walk in what I've taught you. I think it's Luke chapter 6. I'm not sure where, where, where thousands of followers. We can't, we can't, we can't do that. We're, we're going. Hundreds of them left because it's too hard. Let me tell you something, people of God. It's hard to follow Jesus. Isn't it? But he gives us a power and the ability to do so. We all know what Peter went through. But we all know what happened to Peter when he came out of what he went through. Amen? So when you're going through something and God is allowing attacks in your life, make a choice to listen to what God's teaching you, to walk in, the, in, the, in what God's showing you, and come out the other end better. You've heard me speak on valleys and, and, hill, and mountain tops. You're going to get there. It's going to hurt, but you're going to get there. But whatever you do, don't turn your back on Jesus. Don't turn your back on Jesus. It's easy, folks. Listen when I say this. It's easy. It's easy to say I've had enough. It's easy to say, you know what, I'd rather just I'd rather just sit here and vegetate rather than go on and get me some Jesus. I'd rather sit here and, and, and I called my son up one time and I said, What are you doing, son? He said, Well, I'm playing with he's a Lego nut. He's got Legos coming out of his ears. He's got Lego art. Art remote control. He's got Legos everywhere. I called him up on a Saturday. I said, What are you doing, son? He said, I'm just getting my Legos ready for tomorrow. I said, well, I said, you know, tomorrow Sunday. He said, yeah, but I'm going to stay on play with Legos. I said, no, you're not. He said, Dan, I'm tired. I said, I don't care how tired you are. I said, as long as you call yourself a believer, you need to be in the place where the believer can work on you. Now, if there's something wrong, if you're sick, or if you have to watch your kids, I get that. But don't stay home and play with Legos just because you want to stay home and play with Legos. Next day he goes to church, calls him, Dad, I had a great time. It's because when you're reluctant to join forces with other like believers, that when you, when you do it out of reluctance, that's when you get powered up. Amen. You know, my daughter is, I, I, I'm not going to say this cruelly, simply because she's my daughter, but I know her spirit. She hasn't even tapped into. She hasn't even tapped into. What God has for this place. She hasn't even tapped into the prophetic. She has a little bit. But she hasn't even tapped into the prophetic that God wants to spill over here. But you know what the difference is? You've got to be ready. Amen? I don't know if you, I don't, I don't want to, you know, um, be whatever. But Tim and Chris, I don't know if you know this Tim and Chris. Tim and Chris's worship has went to another level. Would you agree? Yes. It's went to another level. Their worship has went to a place that, that is, is, is breaking through the glory cloud. Amen? 
And the reason is because they are ready to let God move in their life. They've always been ready. They've been ready since I've known them. But sometimes it takes a situation. Sometimes it takes a it takes an opportunity. You know, when you're a worship person or a prayer leader or a prayer warrior or whatever else, if you don't get a if you don't get a a, a, a leading or a following, you won't do it. But when the Holy Spirit has opened up the door, you're stepping that thing, man, and you'll come to your glory and you'll just whatever. And that's what we have to pay attention to. Job had a purpose to show us and teach us what we don't do. At the same time, he showed us what we should do. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come before you today, Lord, and we're so thankful that you are alive and that you are active and you work things out within us. We're so thankful that you sent the Spirit to us to bring us revelation. This morning, Lord, I pray that your word has penetrated somewhere deep into our spirits. I pray, God, for those who are hungry for something, ate today. And I pray for those, God, that, that were already full when they got here, they at least got something. So I pray, Lord, as you as we continue with the service, with the communion, and with the offering, I pray, God, that you remind us of who you are in us. And what we go through only produces endurance, produces strength, produces an ability to show the world, to show the devil, that we cannot be over. So this morning, Lord, we give you a big amen and a big praise you, Jesus, for what you're doing and accomplishing in our lives. In Jesus' name, all God's people say.